Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, UDS Dental Data Trends, the COVID-19 Impact. My name is Deborah Schmidt. I'm the Member Services Manager for the National Network for Oral Health Access, or NOAA, and today's moderator. I am also joined today by Candace Owen, and she is NOAA's Education Director. So the learning objectives today are, number one, we do review UDS dental data for 2020 in comparison to previous years, describe how COVID-19 impacted dental clinic operations, and finally discuss challenges and opportunities for dental programs. Before we get started, let's go over a couple of housekeeping items. Your phones will be on mute, but you can submit your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time during this presentation. We will get to as many questions as possible. Any unanswered questions that you uh, have uh, posted for us will be sent to the speaker for a direct response. This webinar is also being recorded and will be posted to the NOAA website later in the week. Following this webinar, a short survey will then be emailed to those of you who, have, uh, who are attending. So you can provide feedback and to request continuing dental education credits. Please note that you must complete the survey by close of business Friday, October 1st. So let me introduce today's speaker. Since 2005, Dr. Bob Russell has served as the Public Health Dental Director for the State of Iowa Department of Public Health. He holds a BS degree from Grand Valley State University, a DDS degree from Loyola University of Chicago, a Master's in Public Health from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, an MPA in Public Administration and Certification in Public Management, CPM from Drake University. Dr. Russell is also a member of the Association of State and Territorial Dental Directors, the National Network for Oral Health Access, the American Dental Association, the Iowa Dental Association, and the American Association of Public Health Dentistry. Dr. Russell was appointed a fellow to both the International and American College of Dentists, the Phi Alpha Alpha International Honor Society for Public Administration, and he is also a member of the American Dental Association's Dental Quality Alliance Measurement, Development, and Maintenance Committee. I now turn our presentation over to Dr. Bob Russell. Greetings, everyone. Before we start the presentation, I just want to reflect on the fact that each of you are probably in health centers that are suffering from the COVID uh, climate, as well as now just beginning to recover to some level of normalcy. I do want you to know, though, that normal is an illusion. I don't believe we will ever go back to absolute normal. We will have to adapt to a new normal. And that's something that I think over time we will figure out. Uh, there will be resources brought to, to available, which we'll share some on this presentation. But I think it's a good thing to step back a bit and kind of look at how COVID impacted the entire health center movement, specifically the dental clinics. What has been the trend in data? Uh, and it's not a pretty picture. Okay. okay. So this is our objective. We're gonna review the UEDS data for 2020. That's the year that COVID had the greatest impact so far. We're gonna share data trends, the UDS data over the last five years in, in comparison, and describe how COVID-19 impacted the dental clinic operation. So here's the background. We go to January through February 2020, and that's when really COVID-19 crisis hit. Um, it began to emerge and a lot of different states took on emergency actions in order to lower the risk of, in, uh, of infection and spreading of infection. And part of that required dental programs to either shut down or to, to re, uh, reduce their services on an emergency basis. Um, the dental clinics began reopening as of May, June 2020 with new infection prevention and control protocols, including new equipment and new processes. Uh, I have to admit they cost money, but these changes did happen. Then the rollout of COVID vaccines began in December 2020. And now we're looking at uh, the next report, which is due January of uh, the next report that was released January 1 to December 31st of 2020. So, uh, which was uh, to February 2021. So we're gonna look at all of these factors and then kind of reflect back on how things have changed. So let's start with workforce. 
Now, this is the overview. You look at, let's look at 2019 first. In 2019, we had a little over 1,300 health center grantees. We had 29, uh, almost $30,000 of total patients served. Now, compare that to 2020 at the top. We have 1,375 health centers, quite a reduction of 10 health centers in that, in that number alone. And then we had a total patient service of 28,591 uh, plus. Um, so we're looking at 10 less health centers compared to 2019 and 1.2 million less patients served in 2020. So overall, the big picture is health centers, set, they suffered a setback during this period. And here's another example, graphically speaking. As we look at 2006 and we go forward each year, you can see it's been almost a steady climb each year of increasing number of health center dental programs overall. But as we get to the peak of 2019, suddenly there's a drop. And we go from 1,117 dental programs down to a little over 1,090. So that means there's been casualties. There's been programs that were lost. Now we look at the number of health centers with dental programs overall, and you can see that there was a very rapid increase starting at 2016 at 75, 2017, 78, 2018 and 2019 are pretty much balanced at 80% of all health centers had a dental program. Well, we've lost ground in 2020. As you can see, it has moved down to 79. It is fortunate it has been no further than that. But the good, the, the good news is it hasn't been a big a decline as we probably would have expected, but it is a decline nevertheless. So how many programs did we lose? We mentioned there were 10 programs uh, health centers with medical that were lost, but what we didn't reveal is that 27 dental programs were lost in that same period. So between 2019 and 2020, we lost 27 dental programs and health centers. I mean, we lost 10 health centers altogether. So it's, it's been a setback. Now, as far as health center users, this is a very good graph to kind of look at. The total users at the top in the green arrow, you can see has been rising consistently from 2016 all the way into 2019. But then look at 2020, it's been a decline. The same thing with medical users. There's been that rapid rise, and then it's been a slight reduction, not quite as bad as the overall users, but where did the big loss come? Now look at the dental clinics in yellow at the bottom. The yellow, the rise wasn't as rapid, but we also see a very significant decrease. Uh, in 2020 from what we had in 2019. So dental programs have definitely suffered maybe the worst part of this entire pandemic. Um, they are the ones that seem to be taking uh, the losses more than, than other parts of the health center. Now here are dental program FTEs. Let's talk about staff a little bit here. You can see here at the green, which is other dental personnel, the biggest loss was among dental assistants, dental tech. And I think the majority of those are dental assistants. But the thing is, look at the loss of 11,482 at the top of green arrow down to 10,193. We don't see quite that great a loss among dentists or RDHs or our dental hygienists, which is, which is great. We do see some loss, there's no doubt. But it's dental assistants that we really are seeing the largest decline as far as loss of personnel. So what does our workforce ratio changes? If you look at the dental assistant, it went from, in 2019, 2.16 to 2.09, okay? We look down at dental hygienists, 0.54 to 0.51. Once again, not a greatest decrease in hygienists as it is with assistants. So, then I imagine that probably plays out almost in every state, that the, the number of dental assistants available have become a little bit harder to find than, than in the past, but not quite as bad um, it has been bad for the assistant, but not quite as bad for dental hygienist. And so keep in mind, we are looking at the large picture. We're not looking at individual places because as all statistics work, they're higher and lower uh, than the mean. So now we're gonna, we look at the rapid response team. This is something Noah created. It comprises of 51 dental team members from safety net organizations, including community health centers, primary care association, state departments of health and academic settings. Uh, so there are 51 people in this group. 
the goal of the rapid response team formed back in two, early 2001 was to inform NOAA technical assistance around COVID-19 and below. So this has become a resource to you, the health center, and it monitors how these changes are affecting uh, health centers as we go forward. So there was a survey in February, survey included questions about utilization of dental workforce for such things as vaccination, recruitment, retention, and dental team wellness. We had a response rate of 35 out of 51, which is about 69%. What we have learned is, uh, as far as re recruitment and retention, uh, COVID has had an effect on recruitment and retention of dental staff, including uh, dental assistants. As you can see, 73% of the participants responded yes. And that's an overwhelming number of health centers saying that they are having a shortage of dental assistance, specifically dental assistance, uh, and they're unable to fill open positions. Now, the reasons why many of those assistants uh, and staff left was many of them had to care for their children. As we still struggle with COVID today, many schools are still looking at home training rather than having them in the class. And that affects many of the assistants' ability to be available when their children are home. Uh, if they can't find uh, affordable daycare, uh, then they themselves have to remain home with the children. And many have chosen to do that. And then there are some who respond simply to fear. The fear that the health center is not a safe place, that COVID exposure has not been truly mitigated. And it's, it's, it's the belief of the individual. It's not necessarily a fact, but I just want to mention that fear is a driver to people making many decisions. So here's a poll. And it's my, this is the question. My health center furloughed and or laid off dental staff in 2020 due to COVID. The responses we're looking at are no or yes, but they have all been brought back and rehired or yes, uh, we're in an attempt to bring back our dental staff. So please take the poll and, and we'll continue. Ten more seconds on the poll. I'm a bit surprised that the majority of you said no. There's been no layoff, and yet a good percentage of you, 33%, said yes. Uh, but they have all been brought back and rehired. That's great. Uh, there's a small percentage of 13% says that, uh, yes, they have been impacted, but they have not been able to bring back the entire staff pre-COVID levels. I'm glad to see that the majority of you um, are doing better. So that's good. That's good to see. So what are the barriers to recruitment and retention of staff? Uh, that we find today. Unemployment benefits, as many of you know, the federal government has created rescue uh, funding for many people to pay such things as rent and to, to beef up the unemployment. Uh, many of those benefits have, have, have sunsetted. However, they were very, very, very uh, relevant uh, during the period of COVID. Then there was high COVID rates in the community, uh, which made people probably very afraid, uh, not to mention the fact of the fact infections were there. Um, we didn't really want those individuals who are infected in our health centers, in our clinics. So, uh, so those became that became an issue. Distance learning for staff, children, which I already mentioned, and then there's just COVID-related stress, uh, isolation, those things that people don't venture out of their homes uh, very much, and so that became a problem. And then with that, health centers suffered a reduction in production, um, and then a lack of qualified candidates. Many people who, uh, if they were available to be hired, they didn't have necessarily the skill sets to, to meet the position's requirement. And then, of course, competing with private practice, because private practices also face similar uh, reduction in staff. 
as well as loss of dental assistance. And they are busily trying to recruit their staff's uh, levels back as well. So we're competing with the general dental marketplace. And then there's no low number of applicants for open positions. A lot of this can go back to what we mentioned about parents remaining home with their children or even continuing unemployment benefits. So either of those could play a role as well as fear uh, to return. So those are significant issues. Now, the American Rescue Funding uh, is about, this is something NOAA has been given by the federal government to help with the dental assisting workforce. Uh, what they do primarily is do a needs assessment to find out what is lacking, who's having problems with assistance, um, so we can know the data, which is off, obviously very, very important for what we do. Identify those health centers with in-house dental system training programs. Uh, that is one of the ways that we do recommend, as far as health centers, uh, begin to address their shortfall in health um, care assistance is by training them in-house. Um, when that's possible. So that's something we definitely are looking at. And then to try to develop resources and to disseminate those resources to you, the health center operators. So you will have tools at your, at your uh, disposal to be able to, to help you recover with, uh, with your staffing needs. So let's talk about productivity impact because I think it is, we have already talked about workforce. We've talked about a little bit about the statistics on the losses of dental programs, as well as the loss of health centers that has occurred due to COVID. What has this done to impact productivity? Uh, and I imagine you can already in your mind understand it probably it did have an impact. Um, so here we go, we'll look at the encounters per dentist, which is the top bar, the green, big drop big drop for roughly a little over 2,500 down to roughly a little under 2,000. And that all occurred in that year to 2019 to 2020. We see some reduction in hygiene productivity as well and assistant and therapists, dental therapists were included in this. We see a little drop in, in their productivity as well, but not quite as high as the dentist. Uh, so the dental productivity counter rates really took a nosedive uh, as compared to the other two. But the thing we can learn from this particular graph is that there has been a reduction in overall productivity in all aspects of the dental program. Uh, so I think that is that is clearly understood. And once again, we're seeing it from uh, a bar graph uh, illustration starting in 2016. You can see 2017, 2018, 2019, we've been steadily increasing in the number of visits that we've been able to process through our national health centers. But then look at 2019 to 2020, look at the huge drop, 17,000 down to 11,000. That is a huge cliff. So once again, we expected there would be some loss in productivity and yes, indeed, we are experiencing it. And so this is another uh, visit per patient annually. You can see there was a big impact here. Going back in 2016, 2017, and 2018, we see a regular step of at least uh, one to two, uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.02 points. Well, you kind of balanced out in the year 2019 at 2.58, the same as uh, 2018, but look what happened in 2020. We dropped back down under the visit per annual in the year 2016. So we are actually back to like 2015 levels compared to where we were. So we've gone back shall we say, backwards, big, back to 2015, from a steady, progressively improving picture to one that was not so great. So, but there's some other things that emerged during that period too. Probably something that was very profound, but I think has been very useful to those health centers and states where these visits count. And that's that telehealth became an emergent trend during COVID-19. So, what the ADA found in February of 2020 is 61% of public health dentists were using some level of virtual technology for problem-focused evaluations. This is compared to only 24.8% in April 2020. So you can see there was a rapid rise in the use of telehealth or teledentistry. Many states passed emergency orders allowing the use and reimbursement of teledentistry. So if you were fortunate to be in those states, then this became a reimbursable uh, visit. And so uh, hopefully very productive for you. And as you can see, look at the number of encounters uh, in the health centers that jumped just based on televisits alone. 
You go back to 2019, we had roughly 4,800 visits that were done by a telehealth visit. Now you look at 2020, it jumped up to 275,000 plus visits. Huge. Now, why is that important? Because the health center operates by encounters, per visits or encounter visits. If you can get those visits in your chair, that is how we normally would account for an encounter. However, if we could get those visits virtually, that still adds to the total number of visits in your patient schedule. And for that reason, it counts. This is a billable service. It counts as a visit. So even though we see on the hard side, which is the number of patients in the chair, we're seeing some level of recovery or recovery with the use of telehealth services. So uh, I just want you to know that that's one way health centers have been able to, to address uh, the losses from the actual chair. So this has been, there, this is a, a very viable way to do that. So virtual visits, COVID-19, uh, the strategy behind virtual visits really is that it increases access to dental services while also implementing social distancing. Because we all, we know, and this is what uh, good infection control says, the less the individual is in contact with the potential source of an infection, obviously the better the outcome. In other words, there's less chance that they will come down with the infection. So by virtual visits, you're able to basically eliminate contact with the patient in the health setting where there is some risk that transmission of COVID might occur. Not necessarily that it's a big risk at all, but it eliminates all risks doing it this way. It's used for triage, oral health education, and preventive visits. Uh, it can even be used for diagnostic purposes uh, or even treatment planning uh, prior to actually having them come into the office. It alleviates capacity issues in clinics, uh, especially right now, a lot of clinics are facing a resurgence of patient population trying to get back into the clinic to make up for time when they were uh, basically forbidden to do so. And so telehealth is one method for you to triage your patients and out of the clinic while still utilizing your existing facility to its maximum use. And here's a good NOAA website which will give you some uh, a brand new guide on teledental use. So if you're not totally familiar with teledentistry, I highly recommend you go to this particular website and see the new resource that NOAA has made available for you. Now, UDS CNET measures. This is an interesting series of, of uh, bar graph here. Uh, the numerator, uh, which we talk about, it's in the orange, and that's the total number of sealants placed. And of course, the denominator, the total number of patients between the ages of six to nine at moderate risk or high risk for dental decay. So we go back to 2016, you can see you have about 13, 134 um, plus patient Stevens placed in a population of about 275,690. And you will see that that number dipped a little bit in 2017, even though the number of sealants placed increased. So the total number of individuals seen actually diminished slightly from 20, 275 to 266. Uh, thousand in 2017, but the number of total students placed went up from 134 to 135. And we also look at the year 2018, we see that the number of patients actually increased a little by 3,000 to 2 to 69,000, and the number of sealants placed continued to increase to 142,000 plus. Now we go to the year 2019, suddenly we see quite a reduction in the number of total patients uh, that are being seen. However, the number of sealants continue to rise. We're at 143 uh, in 2019. So, you know, even though patient numbers fluctuate, the number of sealants placed continue to advance. And that was a good sign. Now let's look at 2020. Uh, not so great. Now we see that the number of sealants have dropped from 143,000 to only 81,000. And we see the number of patients likewise took a nose dive from 252 plus to 167 plus. So yes, that was a hurt uh, as far as the UDS sequent um, monitor. It um, definitely records that preventive services have been reduced due to the COVID impact. 
And so here we are here with the the UDS sealant measure, once again, just showing it by itself, how it's gradually risen each year up until 2019. Okay, so we were on a real good course. Then suddenly, wham, we hit 2020 and there's a big reduction. So I think that's pretty clear. Now, these are helpful rest, uh, references that we'd like for you to, to consider so you can understand a little bit more about the tools that measure these type of measurements. Um, also, the Dental, American Dental Association has a health policy institute that actually helped to, to get this data so that we're able to compare health center to health center. So with that, I thank you for your time and I'm open to your questions. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, if folks could please throw their questions into the Q&A box um, and we can uh, take some time to answer some questions. Um, some that I've received um, with more people being vaccinated, uh, how do you suggest approaching conversations with staff and patients who are now becoming more lax on masking and their PPE? That's a very good question. And it is very difficult because of personal convictions of the individual. Uh, uh, <clears throat> our entire country is fragmented up over that very thing. And some people feel very strongly on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I'm not going to say it's going to be, uh, you're going to be successful. Um, converting everyone. And what is very important to understand the safety risk that these individuals bring, not only to your practice, because if, if you're practicing, you got to worry about your liability as well, uh, as far as having uh, in, uh, assistants and, and staff that actually could be potentially infectious, not to mention those who would be exposed while on the job. So I think it's imperative to really just say to the, to the individual that, you know, I care about you. I truly care about your health. And this COVID thing is real. Uh, if we don't have you protected, then it's going to be very difficult for you to be available to our patients should you become ill. Uh, this is a contagious disease and it can be spread to other staff members as well. And so we really, really want to keep you and the staff as safe as possible. The use of PPE as well as the vaccine is just two modalities for us attempting to keep you as safe as possible. It's a matter of showing that you're concerned for the individual, not so much challenging their biases. And if that doesn't move them, uh, then I think you really have to sit down and decide, is it beneficial to your practice to have such a person on staff in case something goes wrong. Uh, I know the incident is low, but if you're in an area where COVID is, is kind of a, a still happening, especially that new Delta variant and, and, it's, and it's pretty prominent, there's a good possibility you're gonna have infected patients coming in your practice uh, that may not be symptomatic and they could still be carriers. So keep in mind, even vaccinated people can carry the COVID virus. That means that if you got an unvaccinated person working in your clinic exposed to those individuals, they could become infected. So it's not so simple as, you know, I just say, don't relax your PPE, don't relax your protocol, because that truly is what's keeping us safe. Thank you. What are your thoughts on vaccine mandates for dental professionals? Controversial. And I say that because it seems like the more we try to mandate something, the more people fight back. Uh, it would be much better and easier to try to do it in a persuasive way. Uh, I'm far more supportive of that, but if it turns out there is no other way, and I still think the practice has to consider liability, uh, I think that's still a very important thing, uh, because if they get the infection while on, uh, on the staff, uh, they could possibly bring legal charge against the practice. Just so that you know that you, the, those staff members working under your supervision, are also you are responsible for their health while working in your environment. So that might mean you may have to take a little bit more of a, of a band-aided uh, situation. Uh, I think you just have to weigh it very carefully. Uh, do, you, um, do we know what drove down the denominator in the sealant age uh, population? Is it because less sealant age patients received in-clinic care? A little bit of combination of both. Uh, the demand went down as well. In other words, you have less patients showing up. And I imagine that uh, the ability to have hands-on 
to place the sealants were reduced. Keep in mind, some health centers have school-based programs where they're placing the sealants on site at the schools. They were no longer able to get to those schools. And so the overall picture is complicated. Uh, it's no one thing, it's a number of different variables. How can we help uh, reassure our patients of the safety of dental practices during the pandemic? Are there, is there data available about dental clinic acquired COVID infections? I'm going to say as a public health official, that's a complicated question. Uh, there was a time states did invest in what we call trackers or tracers who were able to try to connect where the infection occurred and to the individual being infected. That effort was very short-lived. Um, many states just basically moved away from it. And so we really didn't have a sustained level of tracing to actually say whether it occurred in a dental practice or not. The fact that no data is not proof of data. I wanna make that perfectly clear. The lack of data is no proof of a conclusion. To say that no one has ever received a in COVID infection going into a dental practice is false because you don't have the data to sustain that. I'm not saying there's a large number of them. I'm saying we simply don't have the tools or the capacity for tracing it. And that is true nationwide. I mean, this was a real crisis. This was a, a, a catastrophic failure of the public health system. Uh, it tried to adapt, but it, its adaptation was very slow and incomplete. So I don't think there's a true picture to this day what really happened. Um, so I would say to every health center, practice as if COVID is right now a crisis. And in some places, it is. So don't relax your standards. Not now, because this thing is still out there and you don't want it coming into your site. And I think we're taking good steps in that direction. Just don't relax it. Do you think that the safety protocols like N95s for aerosol generating procedures um, do you see that going away or becoming a new normal for us, um, similar to how providing dentistry changed when HIV came out? Uh, I think technology will determine that. There will be new type of uh, devices that will be developed that probably can replace the N95. But at the same time right now, I think N95 is a, is a constant reality in our given environment. Keep in mind, infectious diseases are not going away. And if anything, they're going to be worse in time. Uh, we got environmental changes taking place right now. We've got bacteria and viruses that are becoming basically immunoresistant. In other words, we can't even kill them with the bacteria, with the, the um, vaccines and various different things we have. So this is only going to get worse as we go forward. Uh, and so I don't think we can relax any protocol, but I do think technology will make some changes along the way. How would you suggest addressing when an individual tells you that they don't want the vaccine since they have real antibodies after suffering from COVID-19? There is statistics that COVID has been uh, encountered more than once. Uh, individuals who've been reinfected with COVID as they've gone forward. No one infection makes you immune because of the fact that the virus is mutating. It's becoming more virulent, it is changing its shape. And so you may have had an exposure to COVID at one point, which was the alpha virus, but now you're facing the delta virus. We've got the mu virus. We've got other viruses that are coming about that are based on COVID. So you can never 100% know you are immune. And I think that's the thing you have to tell the patient um, that yes, we have got people, and I even know personally a person who received, uh, who actually caught COVID twice within a matter of months. How do we handle increased operational costs with new safety protocols moving forward without expected governmental funding and not wanting to incur the costs onto our patients? Oh, now that's an extremely good question and a very complex one. There is a way. But those ways are still right now under exploration. I will say what I really believe should happen is we need to move to a value-based payment structure uh, where health centers paid up front with a certain amount of money to take care of a certain number of patients. And that is not an earned amount of money that is based upon an encounter. 
Uh, right now, if you hit a crisis like we did in 2020 and your patient's flow stops, you're not generating any revenue. You still have fixed costs. So you still got salaries, you have everything else there, but you do not have revenue or not a significant amount, even if you do telehealth services. So the, the thing is you need is that revenue up front so you could afford the PPE, afford the, the, uh, the, the, the infection control uh, changes that you needed to implement. And that's what a value-based care program would do. Uh, it's a different type of, of funding. It's a different type of payment structure. Right now, I can tell you, CMS is looking at that very strongly. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Center of Medicaid Measures and, and Innovation, they're looking very closely at 28 different models of value-based care reimbursement systems in the in the medical sector. Uh, they're going to move it. They're going to move it into Medicare and ultimately Medicaid uh, down the road. And I think COVID has only made that that march faster. So I think ultimately we're going to see a value-based care transformation among health centers and i would just say let's get ready for it how much is this shortage in dental assistant staff going to affect our total patient encounters well there are a number of variables you need to look at number one there's changes in technology that you probably haven't you may not have paid a lot of attention but there's a lot of new technology coming out that could actually help in patient flow uh, primarily your workflow. Uh, some of these new technologies might be used to, to reduce some of the stress on your staff. We will need dental assistants. I'm not saying that that is never going to go away, but we need to be able to train our dental assistants on the job so that we're able to utilize them and they are familiar with the health center environment. What I think will happen is health centers, the larger health centers definitely should be a, a teaching location where dental assistants can be trained by more senior dental assistants and therefore their skill sets brought up to speed and they can actually be shared among the health center network so i think train the trainer the trainers training the trainees is the the way to go we can take people off the street to actually turn them into good health centers uh, uh dental assistants if they're willing to to learn do you think that the 2021 numbers will be similar to 2020 I think there probably will be a little increase. It won't be dramatic. As I mentioned, the way the stats are looking now, we have gone from, from 2020, we've gone back to the same level of productivity and staffing as about 2015, 2014. I do believe that the 2021 will probably put us back to about 2017. Uh, which means there's some recovery that's occurring. It's just not recovering as steeply as it dropped uh, because of a number of factors that we've, we've talked about as far as patients uh, coming back to the practice, the law, law, loss of staff, as well as the cost of, uh, of infection control. A number of management issues still remain that we need to address going forward. But I do believe uh, we will see some slight recovery. Since most private practice uh, dental clinics have less than 100 employees and do not accept Medicare or Medicaid, do you foresee a further loss in dental health center staff numbers? If so, how can we lessen the negative impact this will have on our programs? What I do see is that medical, this is what I feel about the FQHC. The potential in an FQHC to be the leader in healthcare is what I see. I do not see it following the private practice. Uh, because of the fact we do get a value-based care program, I think we're already set up to be very successful underneath that change. The good part about a health center is we already practice what I call integrated healthcare. We're already probably the most safest environment that a patient can actually go to because we can prove we are certified infection control uh, organizations. We look at other things other than just dental care. We look at their blood pressures, uh, other things that are becoming available. I feel like we actually have enough to say that we are better than the general private practice, especially for the low income who really, really depend on us. Uh, upper income, they're always gonna shop around. Uh, you can't do much about that. Um, but I do believe that we're already looking at Medicare possibly having a dental benefit. That's going to be a game changer, big game changer, uh, if that should come about. Uh, we're looking at uh, efforts to get Medicaid to, 
get rid of the the adult uh, disclosure where states can choose to add adults or not, but they have to have them. So if these things go into effect, the good news is most of our health centers will have paying patients. That's what's going to go forward. The number of totally uninsured patients will decrease. So I'm pretty excited about some of these trends, uh, especially if they become fact. What are some good ideas to help prepare for value-based care? They are baby steps, okay? There are steps you take toward it. I don't think you need to just uh, bite off the whole thing at one time. I think you take small steps. One thing is you have measures. Measures that look at your productivity, measures that look at what services you're rendering and how those measures affect the outcome for your patients. If you put sealants on a person or a child who's higher risk or higher risk, does that make a difference down the road as you do your recall? Does it lower the number of frank decay you're seeing? If you put them on a good regimen of hygiene, you get them basically showing compliance to home care, does that result in decreased amount of decay? Those are things you can measure now. The idea behind value-based care is value outcomes. In other words, I do A and you get B as a result. So we're trying to connect the dots here is what we're doing. We're trying to say that if I put a filling in your mouth, for example, and that filling keeps getting bigger every six months, you come in, I'm drilling out more decay, that is poor value because the person still has the disease carries, which you have not managed or the patient hasn't attempted to manage. You've got to manage the process that leads to disease. And that's what value-based care is about. And you'll be paid to do that rather than being paid just to fill after the problems occurred. So that's what value-based care means. So start early, look at your medical records and your dental records, track those things that you do, especially when it comes to prevention, like fluoride varnishes, sealant, start with those things to begin with, uh, home education, track how often that is done on the patient, and then look at the results after six, one year, two year type of examination, and you're already on your way. Are you hearing of any mass exodus of dental staff as a result of health centers anticipating the requirement of a vaccine mandate without a testing option? Well, I can tell you the truth, that's not just limited to dental staff. That's happening across the entire healthcare sector. We are seeing a number of people even being fired in a number of places where they've mandated it. And we do see a number of them refusing. It's getting hotter politically because of that very thing. Um, this is gonna have to work itself out. Uh, we do have a divided country right now. Let's just face it. Uh, there are those who don't believe COVID exists. There are those who believe that the, the vaccine will kill us in four years. There are those who probably would even think drinking bleach is a good cure. We have a real mess uh, of people as far as information. This was a disaster. Uh, we're going to take some time to recover. This is no doubt. So I would just say, just be ready. It's going to be a slow digging out of this ditch. Most of our patients at this clinic are homeless who do not put value to dental care. How would value-based care benefit our clinic? Well, part of the job of value-based care is to convince those individuals that to value their care. That effort, the effort. I mean, if you look at value-based care, this is what I think is different. We're not just paying for dental services. We're paying for overarching services. The value-based care contract won't be limited to just dental. It'll be actually comprehensive. So in other words, the failure to unaddress the patient's need for care is a failure of the entire health system. It's not a failure just of dental. There is also the sharing of patients with the medical side, the behavioral health side. You're probably gonna be looking at a great dependency on community health workers. You're gonna look at a number of community health workers and any outreach workers who will work with families to actually help them and educate them to keep them on task as far as routine hygiene that's gonna benefit the future. You're going to have them come into your offices and you're going to put disclosing solution, at least your hygienist will, or your hygienist or a good well-trained EFTA or assistant could do that. Put disclosing solution on them right up at the beginning at that recare visits and let's see whether they are effectively cleaning their teeth. If they're not, that's an opportunity for coaching. And guess what? On a value-based care, it's payable. 
that's the difference. And I understand right now why it doesn't make sense because if I'm paid on a fee for service that's limited to certain procedures, then that's what I'm going to do. We want to take that out of the equation. We want to start looking at paying you to provide health. And so that's a whole different modality. And I don't think right now we can wrap our minds around it, but it would be great to be able to do what you know is right for the patients and not always resort to the drill. Thank you. I don't see any other questions um, coming through. If there's anything that comes up following the webinar, please feel free to email Noah at info at nnoha.org and we can get those um, responses back to um, Bob and he can answer you as well. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Deb to close us out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bob. We really appreciate the time. And what a great informative presentation. I'm glad there were so many questions and, and you've been extremely helpful as always. Uh, so uh, the attendees who do um, uh, have attended today, you will receive a copy of the presentation slides and a link for the survey that we talked about at the beginning. Um, we will also post these presentation slides and the audio file as well to the NOAA webpage. Uh, and remember, if you are requesting continuing ed uh, dental education credits, you must return that survey to us no later than close of business Friday, October 1st. And with that, this now concludes today's webinar. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.